Good morning. How are you guys? I hope it's been a good Sunday morning for you so far, uh, even before you got here, but I know it is since you've gotten here. Uh, I shared with this, uh, uh, I shared this last hour, uh, you know, we sing that song like um, about Jesus and his name is just there. There is power in the name of Jesus. And as his name was up there, I just was saying in my head, uh, the blind receive sight in Jesus' name, the sick are healed in Jesus' name, and the dead come to life in Jesus' name. Now, here's, here's just a cool piece of, um, here's a cool detail uh, that you can add to your faith and just your knowledge in pursuit of God that I find absolutely fascinating. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, we all know the original sin. Well, after the original sin, do you remember when God placed an angel that kept Adam and Eve from returning to the garden. He blocked their way back to God. Do you guys remember that little piece? Okay, that angel had a name. It was like you could describe it as a cherubim, all right? Now fast forward to David. David wanted nothing more than to build the temple for God. Like David wanted to build a place where God's spirit would be among his people. That's what David wanted more than anything, but God had different plans. It was actually David's son that got to build the temple. And God made his dwelling among his people in the temple. But there was always a divider. There was a veil that went to the Holy of Holies that only the priest could go in one time a year. And that veil uh, was the separating piece to God. Well, what happened when Jesus Christ was crucified? What was that? The veil was torn. There was an image that was on the veil when it was torn. You wanna know what the image was? It was an image of a cherubim was on that deal. And so Jesus makes a way back to God. And if that's all you get out of this morning, there's gonna be a lot more that you can receive, but if that was all that you got, that there is a God who loves you and there is a way for you to experience his love in your life, and that's through his son Jesus, man, you would have enough to sing praises all day long. Okay, so right now, right now I've got 28 and a half minutes, and I have to cover 500 years in 28 and a half minutes. I'm just telling you, we're all going to be exhausted by the time we're done. I mean, because we're going to do it, man. We're going to get after it. It's going to be so much fun. David, we're going to start this series on David, and here's what you need to know. David is the second king in Israel's, uh, in Israel's history, and he is one of the greatest kings in Israel's history, but here's what makes him great. It's his pursuit of God. It's everything that God did in his life. It's everything God was to David before he was ever king. And so this morning, what I want to do to kick our journey off, to kick our series off in David, is I want to let us know, how do we even get to him? Like, how do we even get there? And like, once we get there, like, why David? Like, why is David important? So this morning, we're going to talk about how we got to David. And that's why we have to go 500 years and now about 28, 27 minutes, and then we'll answer why David before we leave. Okay, so um, let's go back. David, uh, let's go back to about 1500 B.C., okay? 1500 B.C., 1526 to be exact, God raises up a leader. His people are captives in a place known as Egypt, and God raises up a leader to bring them out of Egypt. Does anybody know his name? Moses, awesome. You guys, man, you got history down. Way to go, you guys. 1500 BC, God's people are enslaved in Egypt, and they're saying, God, get me out of here. Get me out of here. And God hears their prayers, and he raises up a dude named Moses, and Moses is going to lead God's people out of Egypt. But Moses was created, and he was saved, and he was rescued for a purpose far greater than that. Not only did he lead people out, but he led God's people in pursuit of God. Because at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's all about him. And he wanted his people to be an accurate reflection of what it looked like to be in a proper relationship. So Moses' role was to lead people in a pursuit of God. 
and he's going to do that for a hundred some years, then that started at 1526 B.C. Around 1400 B.C., we know that Moses has led the people out of Egypt. He has steered them towards their inheritance in the promised land. But man, God's people were a little bit unfaithful. They were a little bit disobedient. And as a result, God said, hey, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and I'm going to teach you some things. And Moses is disobedient, so he doesn't get to see the promised land. Uh, or Sorry, he doesn't get to enter it he gets to see it and before he passes away he turns things over to a guy named Joshua in around 1400 BC 1400 years before Christ Joshua is going to lead God's people into God's promised land it's called Canaan it's a promised land he's going to lead them into their inheritance and God has some rules for his people to follow and here's the rules you're going to remove the people in the land you're going to tear down the altars to their gods. And you cannot intermarry with their people because God knows if you start marrying their people, you're going you're gonna to inherit their practices. And these are pagan following, pagan worshiping, idol worshiping people. And they had already made a covenant with God that you will be our God and we will be your people so there will be no intermarrying whatsoever. Well, we see that Joshua uh, leads the people into the promised land and God does what God promised to be their God and he fights on their behalf. But Joshua doesn't live forever. I think he lives only about 120 years and he passes away. He passes away, but unlike Moses, he didn't pass the torch to somebody else. And in Judges chapter one, we see a bright spot in Israel's history because as a people, and as a nation, after Joshua had passed, they still have to take over the land. We see that the people run after God. They say in Judges chapter 1, who will fight with us? Who will go before us? Did we not just sing a song about that? Who goes before us? Who's with us? God. And God says, I'm going to go with you. But he reminds the people. As I go before you, you're to remove the people from the land and you're to tear down the altars. That's in Joshua chapter one. But something happens in Joshua chapter one where they go into battle and God fights for them, but they don't remove all the people and they don't tear down all the altars. And then on top of that disobedience, because the, the instructions were clear, on top of that disobedience, they make a covenant with the pagan people living in the land. These are a big no-no. Now, here's what you could say. They mostly obeyed. Like, they mostly drove out the people. They mostly tore down the idols. But they just mostly obeyed. Let me ask you a question. When you were growing up and your parents told you to do something and you mostly obeyed, how did that go for you? I don't know how it went for you, but like, when I mostly obeyed, I mostly got in trouble. That's what happened in my life. Did it happen in your life too? Like I mostly got in trouble. And here's the crazy part. We see it in, our, we see it in their lives and we see it in our lives. They wanted full credit for partial obedience. Don't we want that too? We want full credit for partial obedience. They wanted full credit for partial obedience, but that's not how it works. You see, God doesn't want like most of our obedience. He doesn't want like most of our lives. He wants all of our lives. That's why he gave us Jesus. He wants all of us. He doesn't want to like mostly be our God. He wants to be our only God. He doesn't want us to mostly pursue him. He wants us to run after him with all that we are. And man, we don't get full credit for partial participation and let me just tell you something I think if we were honest in our lives like we're pretty good at the mostly stuff like I mostly go to church during the month I mostly love people but I don't like that one right there this one ought to put a holy fear in all of us man this one this one gets me this one gets me, and this is how I know that Jesus is real, and this is how I know God's real. Because like you, I mostly love people. But there are people in my life that it's hard for me to love. But there's this passage that says, man, if you say you love God, but you don't love your brother and sister in Jesus, the love of the Father isn't in you. So if you can truly love somebody that it is hard for you to like, that's not you. That's not what in your abilities. That's God. And if you're having a hard time loving somebody that's hard for you to like, 
man, that just shows us, hey, there's room for us to grow. Well, these people are mostly obeying. They're mostly now in trouble. And God says, from here on out, the people that you were supposed to drive out, they're going to be a snare to you. They're going to be a thorn in your side. And the people he's speaking of is the Philistines. Joshua goes the ways of his father, goes the way of Moses, and he, he, goes, he, he gets to go uh, be in heaven. But now there's not this leader. And so for 325 years, you're going to see Israel enter, enter this cycle. And here's the cycle. They're going to follow God, they're going to obey God, and then they're going to fall away from God. And when they fall away from God, they're going to begin, bad, things are going to go bad for them, and they're gonna, the Philistines are going to oppress them. And what are they going to do? They're going to cry out to God, and God is going to raise up a series of judges. For 325 years, God will raise up leaders to liberate them from the, his judgment against them, but also from the oppression that they're experiencing for the people who are oppressing them. And they're called judges. You know this, man. Like, you've got this down. If you grow up in church, you know all about the judges. Man, you know about a guy named Gideon. Gideon was a judge. You know about a woman. Her name was Deborah. Deborah was a judge. Man, probably one of the more famous judges was a person named Samson. You're like, why on earth are we talking about judges? Well, hey, listen, I told you, we're going to figure out how we got to David. There are four major offices in Hebrew history. The offices are this. It is priest. A priest intercedes, sacrifices on behalf of the people to atone for sins. There are prophets. That is another major office. A prophet's role is to tell the people what God has got to say. The third role is a judge to liberate from oppression. The last judge in a 325-year piece of history where God is raising up judges is Samuel. Samuel will be the final judge, and he is going to play a pivotal role in the history with David. Now, let me just close the loop because I have only talked about three offices and there's four. The fourth office is king, priest, prophet, judge, and king. In the history of Israel, there is only one who has ever held all four offices, and his name is Jesus. He is our priest. He intercedes on our behalf, and his sacrifice made atonement for our sins. And he told us the way to heaven. He told us God's will for us. But he was also a just God, God, and he will judge. But he is also king. He is our king. He is the risen king. He is the only king. But up to this point in history, this is how we get to kings. Uh, Samuel will be the last judge, and it will be his job. It will be Samuel's job to... Uh, to choose the first king for Israel. So why don't you open your Bibles now and let's just look at this moment. Israel's got some waywardness going on. Let's just look at uh, what mostly obedient people do. They rationalize things. They ask for things that are not good for them. And we see that in 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8, read along with me starting in verse 1. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes, and they perverted justice. This is a total side note. Pray for your kids. If you're an adult in here and you love Jesus... Samuel loved Jesus with all that he was, but his kids didn't follow that way. Hey, man, it doesn't matter if you're a grandpa, it doesn't matter if you're a guardian, it doesn't matter if you're grandma, mom, aunt, uncle, mom, dad. Pray for your kids. That's a prayer that we pray in our house all the time. Lord, seal my kid's soul for yourself. Keep praying for your kids. Don't ever stop. Because these guys didn't follow in their dad's footsteps, and it's not going to end up well for them, okay? All right, now look at this, because this is so not nice. Samuel is the final judge, and in verse 4, So all the elders gathered together. They came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You're old. That's rude. We're living in a PC world, man. I'm like, and he said, dude, he's like, I'm just keeping it real. I got, listen, I got a seven-year-old. One time we went to go see grandma and grandpa. And what do kids do? They just keep it real. And I remember one time he looked at his grandma and goes, you're old. I looked at Cheney and I said, we are dead. I said, make sure we haven't been written out of the will yet. But then he said, man, you're old, okay? Okay, so he says, Samuel, you're old. 
And it's not to be offensive. It's just meant to tell the truth. And they're not happy with the, with the way things are going. And he said, hey, you're getting old. Uh, your sons don't walk in your ways. That, I love the honesty there. And this is where things come off the tracks. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. Whoa, 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 whoa. Up until that point, Israel is the only nation on the planet who doesn't have a physical king. They have a divine king, and his name is God. God is their king. And they're asking Samuel for like a human king, like one like everybody else has. Have they completely lost their mind? What has God been doing to every other kingdom as they walked into the, pl- into the promised land? This probably, isn't very, been, this probably isn't the proper etiquette or maybe even the proper place, but I'm just going to say it. God's been kicking their butt. Yeah, Lord, we, we'd like a king like all the other ones. No, you don't. Have you seen what God's been doing to those people? He has been whooping them. And you want that? That's like what mostly obedient people do, man. They're totally blinded by our brokenness. You're like, yeah, we're looking out there. We kind of like the way that looks. We want that too. Oh my goodness, you guys, we want that too. I just, we're going to talk about that for a minute. Let's read this. So give us a king to lead us. Uh, but when they said give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected but they've rejected me as their king. Oh my goodness. As they've done from the day, they've rejected me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until the day forsaking me and serving other gods so they're doing to you. Listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do to them. And over the next few verses, Samuel just says, hey, if you want a king, this is what's gonna happen and this is what life's gonna look like. And he's trying to paint a real picture of what a king does and how a king lives and that you're gonna be subject to that king. And being subject to an earthly king and not a divine king are two different things. But look at what happens in verse... uh, Look at what happens in verse 18. When the day comes, you'll cry out for relief from the king that you've chosen. The Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Oh, my lands. Then, oh, then we're going to be like all the other nations. We'll like if have a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. I'm just telling you, that is absolutely crazy. It's absolutely crazy to want a human king to go out and lead you when you have a divine king, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, who has been going out and securing victory for you over and over and over again, and you want to put some figurehead that's as broken as you are out in front of you to lead you into battle? No way. But I think that we can so, like, and the reason I want to read this is not just, like, how we get to David, because there's lessons in this for us. I think each and every one of us in here, at least I can. There's there's something here for us. Look at this. They wanted what everybody else had, but they had something that no one else had that was better than everything that everybody else had. We do the same thing. You may have a personal relationship with God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. You probably have the spirit of God living inside of you, and yet we dare look around and say, I want that too. I want this because we look at what we don't have and we think it's the answer to all of our problems. We think that what we don't have is actually going to do for us something that only God could ever do do for us. Like we've already got the answer to all of our problems. We've already got the answer to all of the the nagging things that are questioning us, but yet we're crazy enough to look at other things and say, no, 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 that's the answer. No, 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 no. That's idolatry. No, no, no. That's a rejection of God as king. Do you see what God told them? You want this? You're rejecting me as king. And I just wonder, as if you, if you reflect on your own life, as you're looking out at your own life, if you're rejecting God as king and looking to put somebody or something else 
on the throne. And I'm just here to tell you, there is not another relationship with a human being that can fill the place that God has that, it, that is meant for God alone. There is not another substance, there is not another creation that man, that man has made that could ever do for you what God can. Do not reject God as king and settle for a lesser king in your life. But that's what Israel did. And that's what we do too. Now, why are we talking about this? Because David is going to inherit a group of people whose heart is prone to wander. But we also learn something beautiful about God the Father in this. God doesn't deny them what they're asking for. God actually gives them a king. He tells Samuel, he's like, tell the people, he's like, if that's what they want, then we'll give them a king. When Samuel heard all the people said, he repeated before the Lord, and the Lord answered, listen to him and give him a king. Samuel told the Israelites, everybody go back to your own town. I'll get you guys back together. And God picks a king. That tells you something about the character of God. That God loves you enough to let you make mistakes. God loves you enough to let you suffer the consequences of our poor choices. He does it in my life and he does it for you. Because he knows what the king's going to do. He knows that that king that he's going to pick is nothing like him. And he knows eventually we're going to get so broken that we'll come back to him. Because we'll see, wow, I blew it. And we see the character of God that he allows us to come back to him in spite of our mistakes. And this morning, if you feel like you've been blowing it, like there's no way back. And the Hebrew people are, are, are proof. You can blow it. And God in his goodness take you back. And so don't let the enemy lie to you this morning that you are beyond grace because Jesus has made a way back to the Father. Well, they've rejected and they want, but God loves us enough to let us suffer our mistakes. And, and so uh, it's not going to go well for, for Saul. And I don't have time, but here's what I do have time to tell you. You guys need to go and read 1 Samuel chapter 13 because Saul's king and things start off really well for him. He trusts God. But around 1 Samuel chapter 13, read, the, read through Samuel, read this, it's fascinating. Around chapter 13, the Philistines show up with their big bad army and Saul takes a look at his army and he says, no way. You don't need a big army to win because you got a big God. But Saul takes his eye off, takes the eye off the true king and he starts looking at what he can do and he knows he falls short and he makes a mistake in 1, Saul, in, in 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 13. Read it. And then again in 1 Samuel chapter 15, he makes another mistake. And because of that mistake, God rejects him as king. He's like, you can't be king of my people. In first Sam, and then Samuel, so in 1 Samuel 15, after that mistake, Samuel walks up to Saul and he's like, God is going to take the kingdom. Your kingdom will not last. He's going to take it away. Saul was, Saul was anointed king at age 30, and he, and he reigned for 42 years. And sometime during his reign, after his disobedience, God chose another. Does anybody have any idea who the next one was? David. All right, now we're finally going to get to David. Hey, turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and let's read these verses together. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Samuel loved Saul, broke his heart that Saul just kept blowing it. He says, uh, how long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about what I'm going to do and he's going to kill me. That's a bad idea to anoint somebody else king when you already anoint another guy king and when that guy finds out, he's gonna do whatever he can to hold on to his kingdom. Yeah, that'll put your life in jeopardy. The Lord's got a plan for me. He says, hey, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Well, Samuel did what the Lord said and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him and they asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, I come in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come, come to sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Jesse's got no idea what God's going to do, man. It's awesome. 
when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the, Lord, the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. Listen to this. The Lord does not look at things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the, say it all together. The Lord looks at what? The Lord looks at the what? What matters to the Lord? Heart. Let me tell you something. You all look really good. You guys can go home today and you can tweet and you can social media to your heart's content. I look good. What does God care about? He cares about your heart. He cares about your heart. Let me just tell you something. There are days when your heart's good and there are days when your heart's bad and there are days when things are going good and there are days when things aren't so good. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to fake it. If you're not doing good, just be real. And if somebody asks you how you're doing, just say, I'm not doing very good today. God cares about the heart. Like, look at Saul had the position. He had the looks. He had everything. But what he didn't have, what he lacked when it really mattered is he lacked a heart that trusted God. He lacked a heart that wanted God more than anything. And at the end of the day, when you stand and you look in the mirror and you're getting ready for the day and you're thinking about the day, let me tell you what really matters. Your heart. It doesn't matter what the person next to you thinks. And it doesn't matter what the person across the street thinks. And it doesn't matter what the person at the office thinks. It matters what God thinks. And he cares deeply about your pursuit for him. And he cares about the heart. I mean, he just rejected this guy that looked good, looked like he fit the image, looked like he had status, he had this stuff. And God's like, no, I'm not interested in that. And that was just son number one. Look, let's look at verse eight. Jesse called Abinadad and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had a total of seven sons pass before Samuel. That's a lot of sons. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So he asked Jesse, is this all you got? That's funny. Like, is, that's funny. You can make a joke about that. Like, is that all you got? I got two kids, man. And my wife thinks like we're one too many sometimes, <laughs> you know. And it's not always the last one. Sometimes she's like, man, we should have just skipped to the second one. I mean, you know, and she's got, the, Jesse's got eight of them, but he's had seven pass. And Samuel's like, Tell me, is there any more? And Jesse says, they're still the youngest. But why? He's off tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him, for we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and he brought him, and he was ruddy, and he was fine in appearance, and he was handsome features. And the Lord said, rise and anoint this one. He's the one I want. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And Samuel then went to Ramah. Now, all morning long.